talk DNA because DNA is a very broad mm -hmm. term. Yes. How, how, and what is the truth about DNA? What can we really truly get out of DNA in today's okay. world? And how long has DNA been around? Has it been like 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? Okay, so yeah, I love studying DNA. I mean, the first sort of inklings of genomes and all that were back in the 50s. Um, but truthfully, the first case that was used, sorry, the first case that used DNA legitimately in a court to solve a case was in England, and it was 80, 1988. Um, and so really, you did not see DNA really start to become widespread, wide, you have widespread use in a courtroom until probably the mid to late 90s. So that's kind of like exactly when OJ happened. Yeah. So it was in its infancy, basically. DNA yeah. was in its infancy. Yeah. And, and at that time, too, it was difficult to test it because you needed larger quantities of it. There were right. limited the testing. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's evolving so much. I just wrote two newsletter articles in my newsletter about DNA um, and the different the last one is all about kind of the different things that are evolving in DNA right now, DNA um, research, like they're starting to do research and develop tests where you could actually get, it's not really DNA, it's, it's considered more of like a chemical compound that can determine your, your if you're male or female, because wow. DNA doesn't determine that, it can't mm -hmm. determine male or female. Um, you can do Y DNA tests, which determine male, but you have to know first that it was a male. So it's a little tricky. Um, so, so it's constantly evolving. It's constantly getting better. But for instance, this is a fascinating statistic I learned recently um, and sad, actually. So there are over 400,000 rape kits sitting in labs. Yeah, I've seen all that. Over the Correct country. Yeah, what's his name? Uh, last last week tonight, John Oliver did like a oh, I love that uh, I twenty five yeah. minute just yeah. rant on yes. rape kits. It's br yes. it's it's insane it's that that's brutal. Happened. Yeah. No, and he did one before that on death investigation, which was hilarious and yeah. also very true, by the way. Yes, yes. Um. Anyways, he I think something like only point two percent of those kits. Let's just say right now, whatever's getting tested. Only 0.2% of those cases of those kids are actually solved based on DNA. Wow. That's, that's. And it, and you would, ex and you would think that that has the best option of actually yeah. using the DNA to solve a case. This just illustrates the point that most times either DNA isn't available at the scene or it's partial DNA. They can't get a full reading or. Um, it's degraded. It's just not what we think it is based on television. It's good. It's wonderful. It's getting better, but also it's expensive. And so another thing people don't realize is that when an investigator investigates a scene, DNA is not necessarily the first thing that they go test. Like if they have, um, certain things that they're testing because it's expensive. So they'll try other tests first. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, um, test on, I don't know, fibers and, and shoe prints and things like that. They'll send those off to the lab first because they're cheaper, they're easier to get. And then the DNA tests, again, it, it takes six to 12 weeks to get those back. It's sometimes it's backlogged. Um, they're expensive and you got it. And you, you were talking about police budgets and investigative budgets across the country that are constantly being challenged and there's not enough money to, to do things that really need to be done. Mm. And I mean, that's, and there's not enough technicians to be, to be tested. That's another big problem. There's not enough labs and not enough technicians trained to test all of this on top of funding resources being a bit scarce too. So yeah, we need some reform <laughs> in that area. <laughs> it's, I mean, yeah. just, just talking to you in this episode, I mean, I, I, there's uh, being a, being a storyteller and a writer myself, it, it just seems that there is endless amounts of just ripe uh, story ideas in forensics, you know, just to create 
I, you know, th- I mean, literally just having conversations with you right now, I'm, I've had five or six different story ideas, like just, like, well, awesome. we could do this and we could do this detective story here. And they could, do- and that's basically what TV shows are. Like they just, there's yeah. just this one every week. There's just, that's why you could do uh, yeah. 3,000, 5,000 episodes of CSI in multiple states, in multiple <laughs> different genres. You know, it, it, there's just so much, so much to so be much. mined, so much to be mined. Yeah. So as a beginning writer, if any writers are out there who are beginning, uh, you know, this is possibly a really nice niche to walk oh, into yeah. w- without mm-hmm. question. And if you know your stuff and you can actually write really well in this niche, chances of you getting hired at a, at a show or streaming service becomes a lot, uh, a lot better. Would you, would you agree? I would, I would agree. I would hope that would be true. <laughs> <I> would. <laughs> well, in the, in, in the magical world, of course. Yes. 